You're listening to the Building Psychological Strength Podcast, Professional Edition. My name is April Seifert. Not only am I a doctoral level psychologist, but I've been a successful entrepreneur for a number of years and have learned firsthand that building psychological strength can have a direct impact on your professional success. In this Friday edition of the podcast, I'll offer you tools, tips, tricks, and information to help you become stronger, more resilient, and more successful. Let's get to it. Stanford professor Ron Howard said, never confuse the quality of a decision with the quality of an outcome. Welcome back, everybody. Happy Friday. How great was that quote? Oh my gosh, I read that the other day in this life design book that I picked up and I was floored at how powerful that quote is. I mean, think about it. There's, it's one thing to go into a decision, seeking out information, maybe doing some type of analysis, costs, benefits, risks, rewards, all of that. And all of that stuff is stuff that we can control, right? Like we can decide how much research we're going to do. We can decide how broadly we're going to research something or whether we're going to talk to an expert outside of, you know, what we might know directly and et cetera, et cetera. We can control all those aspects of how we make the decision. But once we make it, really that outcome is out of our hands. And so many times other factors can come in and influence whether the outcome of the decision is as successful as we anticipated, given everything that went into making the decision. So I just thought that quote was so incredible because it helps you think about what your role in the decision-making process is and where you don't have control anymore. And so many times in psychology, we talk with people about this because we expand the degree of control that we have into areas that really are outside of our control. I'll give you an analogy or, a, or another example that's that's not related to what we're talking about today, but just to drive this point home. So many times we worry about, you know, what is my behavior? Is my behavior going to cause a particular emotional reaction in the other person? Well, you can't really control that other person's emotional reaction. That's something that's completely out of your control or whether that person makes a judgment of you, or whether that person has a bias. You can't control that. Yet so many times we beat ourselves up and we feel terrible about it because we want to be able to. It makes us feel more certain to think that we have control over that, but we don't. So just as an aside, as another example, but back in the realm of decision making, so many times what happens once we make the decision is completely out of our control. And so what I want to focus on today is the decision-making process itself. And in particular, I want to focus on one particular question. And that question is this. When you're in a situation where you have to make a complex decision, a decision with a lot of moving parts, a decision with a really big outcome attached to it, potentially a decision with a lot of risk around it. So I'm not talking about like what pants do I wear? I mean, if you count those, there's some estimates that people make upwards of 35,000 decisions a day. I mean, it's like, it's gigantic. I'm talking about the really meaningful, bigger, impactful decisions, the ones that have some consequence to them. When you're in that situation, here's my question to you. Do you have a bias toward action or do you have a bias toward analysis? Let me say that again. When you're in a situation where you're making a decision that has some consequence to it, do you have a bias toward action or do you have a bias toward analysis? So to unpack that a little bit, a bias toward action means that you're in a situation where you need to make a decision and you your first gut instinct is to act, is to go out there and do, to try, to get the decision made as quickly as possible. On the flip side, if you have a bias toward analysis, you may sit in that analysis phase gathering every bit of information you can possibly think to find, talking to every single person you can possibly talk to about the decision. 
And you can see where in both cases that can be detrimental, right? If you have a bias toward action and you'll know if you have a bias toward action because more uh, what you tend to experience more often than maybe other people is regret about making a decision about taking an action. So you'll look back and say, gosh, I don't think I should have done that. Or I regret doing that. Or I regret doing that so quickly. On the analysis side, instead of feeling regret, you may feel like you have missed opportunities Or maybe it is still regret, but it's regret about the things that didn't happen. You also may feel like you you take longer to make a decision, which in the end, in some cases, can impact the outcome of that decision. So how successful you can possibly be if you've taken too long to make the decision. So either end of that continuum can be detrimental to how successful you'll be once you make a decision. So what I want to highlight today, and this is the case so many times, so many times within psychology, when we're talking about something like this, and it can be a really broad set of topics, this is sort of a general principle. So many times when we're in a situation where our mind acts in a biased fashion, where it's habitual or more natural or more likely that we will act in a certain way, what our goal is, is to think about a scale, right? Like, like the, the legal scales where there's the two sort of uh, sides of it. Normally, that side of it is pushed down in the direction of what your natural tendency is. So in this case, maybe your natural tendency is one to act, really quickly. So a bias toward action. What we want to do is intentionally put some weight on the other side of that scale to balance ourselves out. I'm going to give another example. Again, that's outside of the realm of what we're talking about, but I just want to illustrate how foundational this principle is, which is this, a gratitude practice. A gratitude practice can feel like it's fake. It can feel like we're putting rose-colored glasses on and ignoring that there's struggle in the world. But that's not what we're doing. Think about those scales again, right? The, the, the legal type scale with the two sides to it. Just as a general rule, our mind's natural tendency, our mind's habit, where it goes more quickly and uh, less with less effort, is toward negative information, We seek out, find, believe, and pay attention to negative or threatening information much more so than positive to the point that we are walking around biased. We're walking around with a biased view of reality. So what a gratitude practice does is it puts weight on that other side of the scale to bring the scale into balance. So while it can feel like you're biased if you're only focusing on focusing on grateful things, what you are doing in actuality is removing the bias that your mind naturally has that it has come become accustomed to having. I hope that makes sense. I'm waving my arms over here while I'm talking about this. I'm gesturing as though you can see me do it. But let's go back to today's topic, right, with decision making. Your mind has a natural bias or a natural tendency toward either action or analysis. And knowing which one you are can help you decide next time intentionally which side of that scale do I need to add weight to in order to balance myself out. This might even be something, you know, you may want to do more of a 360 Uh, assessment of this, think about that for yourself, right? Think about how you see yourself and your decision making, and then maybe ask some trusted colleagues, a friend, somebody who knows you well, ask them what their impression of you is and just take that into account until you, so you can decide whether you think you're the type of person who has a bias toward action or a bias toward analysis. And then the next time you're in a situation where you have to make a decision that has some consequence, some risk, some importance to it, think about that analogy of intentionally adding weight 
to the other side of the scale. Now, I'll say I'm the type of person who has a bias toward action. This is great in situations where there's like a first mover advantage or in situations where early adopters maybe get access to um, a larger piece of the pie or additional um, things that maybe people who waited around didn't get. But it also puts me in a position of potentially regretting taking action before I fully researched or fully understood a particular topic. So because I know that, one of the, I call it my speed bump, a speed bump that I have intentionally put in my, uh, you know, in my uh, route as I'm thinking about moving forward and, and, you know, feeling the urge to take action, the speed bump that I hit is that I tell myself, if this is a decision that it has some consequence to it, I'm not allowed to make it until I wait on it for a few days. I'm also not allowed to make it until I talk it out with somebody. Because sometimes simply the act of talking and having to explain a complicated situation in a way that is clear and understandable to somebody else helps you understand it better. So for me, being a person who's biased toward action, I am better able to make decisions if I put that speed bump in between me and the actual decision that I'm making. Now, if you are on the analysis side you may want to think about, okay, whose opinions really matter and whose don't? Which sources of information are good and which ones are less credible? Because what we can find ourselves doing when we have a bias toward analysis is starting with those good credible sources, starting with those impactful people or those people whose opinions matter, but then as we exhaust that source, we grasp and look for more. So you may want to think about, if you have a bias toward analysis, before you even do the analysis, decide what your sources or what your other people are going to be, and then do that list. And at that point, maybe the, I don't know, it's not really a speed bump. I guess you're kind of greasing the wheels on that side. The grease that you're applying to your wheels is that once you've exhausted that list of people or that list of sources... You're going to pause and ask, have a really intentional question with yourself and ask yourself if you're, in fact, ready to make that decision. If you, in fact, do feel like you can make a good decision here. So I wanted to bring this up in this week's episode because so many times in our professional lives, we have to make these decisions. And regardless of which side of the continuum you're on, you may find that there's some downsides to your knee-jerk, habitual way of decision-making. And these fundamental principles of psychology, the fact that our mind has a biased way of operating just at baseline, but we can impact how we can impact that bias by intentionally adding weight to that other side of the scale, to the opposing side, to balance things out. That is a foundational principle that I want you guys to start thinking about how it applies in all these other different ways of your life. Because you'll start to see that it impacts so many other areas that you might not have realized. So I hope this is helpful in helping you think about how you can make better decisions in your professional life. And P.S. this works obviously in other areas of your life as well, but it's Friday and we're talking professional stuff. So I hope this is really helpful as you think about how you make decisions and how you want to make decisions going forward. Thank you so much for joining me for this professional edition of the Building Psych Strength podcast. If you're an entrepreneur or a business professional and you're interested in becoming more successful, hit the subscribe button. And until next week, be strong, be resilient, and be successful.